Right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the fourth and final installment of our Investing Offshore webinar series. As always, today's, uh, today's session will be recorded and will be sent to everyone afterwards. And please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll try and get to as many of your questions after the presentation as possible. Living in the sun and investing in the shade. Something Peter referred to in one of our previous webinars. But what about those who choose to live in the shade as well? Financial immigration is the topic of today's webinar. To, uh, joining us today is Anthony Chait to try and help us unpack this rather morbid and somewhat complicated subject matter. Anthony is the CEO and founder of Zeridium. He and his team specialize in tax consulting, exchange control, and also have their own family office. Anthony is somewhat of a guru when it comes to issues pertaining to the Saab, having served on their board between 2013 and 2015. Anthony, thank you again for your time and over to you. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Daryl, um, for that introduction. Uh, yes, it is a um, morbid topic, but I think we can uh, take some consolation in the fact that over the last uh, 20 years that we've been doing this sort of work, um, it's uh, not uh, a continuous process but uh, comes in waves. So I think if we think back to some of the um, more shady uh, parts of, of our history, 1960 uh, saw the uh, unfortunate uh, massacre at Sharpville, and there was a wave uh, at that stage of immigration, mainly to the UK. Um, 45 years ago, the 1976 uh, Soweto riots uh, caused uh, another wave. And... Um, Probably, and, and that's perhaps uh, the reason for the topicality of today's webinar, uh, the events at the end of uh, July, the um, unrest and looting and so on, has probably spooked a number of people. So uh, it's quite ironic, though, because um, the topic of this series, of which, as Daryl mentioned, this is the last, is uh, um, offshore investing made easy. And uh, I just make the point that you don't have to financially immigrate uh, in order to uh, invest offshore. But uh, if that decision has been made uh, and it's a very personal decision, then um, our, present today, our presentation today will just assist you with um, some of the uh, issues. Um, so uh, let's look at an outline um, of uh, the presentation. Right. So um, I'm going to take you through a, a brief um, history of where um, uh, the exchange control and um, the way in which people have been financially emigrating uh, from the original days of, uh, you might remember, the blocked accounts or blocked RAND uh, right up until um, the current situation. Um, so uh, I'll take you through, obviously, the, the, the current process um, and then uh, what amounts that uh, will become payable when you leave. In other words, uh, SARS is there uh, to, to collect from you. Uh, the impact on retirement funds, uh, very important and very much in the news lately. Uh, and I'll give you an update on where things stand uh, as far as that is concerned. Uh, citizenship issues as well. A lot of people say, well, if I financially emigrate, uh, do I then forfeit my citizenship of South Africa? That's a question we get asked uh, a lot. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give you an, an answer to that. And then we'll end um, with the uh, what was known as the hashtag 2020 expat tax, which is actually where this whole thing began. Um, and when I say it began was um, uh, that uh, the, the, the whole concept around uh, people being believing that if they left South Africa uh, as expat South Africans, uh, they were still going to be taxed by SARS. So there was a huge fuss at the time. And I'll, I'll unpack what some of that uh, fuss is. Um, OK, so. Um, Let's go into the, uh, the brief history. Um, so 
everything uh, was um, fine until uh, the budget speech of um, February 2020. Uh, and it was always business as usual. Uh, the um, system of uh, immigrating, financially immigrating through uh, the Reserve Bank, uh, the concept of filling out that form called the MP336, which uh, you needed to have attested by your bank. Uh, and that was the pivotal document in the process. And um, it once uh, it was lodged with your bank, you may or may not have acquired tax clearance. And um, then it was approved. Your approval came through from a particular date and uh, you were then uh, good to go. Uh, you could have also have left and some years later come back and mopped up and, and um, finalized your, uh, your procedures, your immigration procedures. So um, the, the, in the budget speech, um, Tito Mbaweni, who was then the Minister of Finance, uh, we still remember him because uh, now we've got uh, Enoch Godongwana. Um, Tito, for, for a number of reasons, and possibly an additional exchange control reform, announced that uh, the concept of immigration uh, from an exchange control point of view was uh, being abolished. Um, and um, prior to that, uh, just to give you a, a, a view of the last 10 years, uh, the October 2010 mini budget um, was the watershed of exchange control reforms in South Africa. Uh, the then minister, uh, Prabhin Godan, uh, in, in his October mini budget, quite unusual because normally these issues are ta tackled in the main budget in February, but um, he uh, deemed it prudent at that stage to make some very significant uh, exchange control uh, announcements or announcements with regard to the reforms. And these are in place uh, almost today. So the coming into being of the uh, special discretionary allowance, uh, which was previously the old travel allowance of 750,000 um, became the, the SDA. And then uh, the foreign investment allowance of 10 million, it was 4 million in October. And then at the very next budget in February, 2011, uh, it was made uh, into the 10 million, which it's been today. So sadly, uh, those amounts, the 1 million uh, single discretionary allowance and the 10 million uh, uh, foreign investment allowance have remained uh, exactly the same. And, and we've seen um, a weakening of the currency and so on. So uh, it would probably be um, useful and beneficial if those uh, allowance or the amounts were reviewed from time to time. But uh, sadly, they've remained in place literally from uh, 2010, 2011. Let's see if um, the new minister, uh, with his maiden budget speech coming up, uh, mini budget, that is this October, whether he will uh, consider um, the matter of, of um, reviewing the allowances. Now, the, um, I make reference to the Constitutional Court uh, case um, that Mark Shuttleworth uh, brought to the Constitution. And that also, the reason for the significance, and very often we get asked, um, well, if I financially immigrate, uh, what does it cost us? What do we have to pay in terms of a levy just for the privilege of uh, immigrating? And that's a very valid question because um, prior to uh, um, the October 2010 uh, mini budget announcement um, by Pravin Gordon at the time, uh, there was in fact a exit levy, not to be confused with the exit tax that we're going to talk about uh, later on in this presentation, but there was a straight 10% um, exit uh, levy, if you like, um, payable on any amounts uh, that you were eligible to remit offshore. And then uh, that was uh, abolished uh, as part of the um, exchange control reforms of October 2010. And that um, annoyed Mark Shuttleworth 
to no end uh, because he'd emigrated, in fact, uh, just one year prior in 2009. And um, he felt totally aggrieved and mounted an attack um, uh, on the government uh, at the Constitutional Court. Um, it's a, 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 a case that, um, that I sat in on was very, very interesting. And um, unfortunately for Mr. Shuttleworth, but uh, the Constitutional Court found against him. And I think probably you can imagine um, the reason or the ramifications if uh, he'd won that particular case, because anyone who'd emigrated prior to 2010 um, from the date that the 10% exit uh, levy had uh, been in force uh, would have been um, approaching the, the government for a refund. And the queue uh, for that refund would have been way longer than the queues um, at our first uh, democratic elections uh, in 1994. So um, the court uh, found uh, against um, Mark Shuttleworth, it was a judgment um, handed down by the former Deputy Chief Justice, uh, Dikang Moseneki. Uh, it's an interesting judgment um, if you care to take the time to, to read it. So um, from 2010, and notwithstanding the protestation of Mark Shuttleworth, uh, the exit levy was abolished. So uh, any amounts that you uh, export uh, in terms of the allowances um, or particularly upon immigration are not subject to any levy imposed by the Reserve Bank. Then um, in uh, May of uh, this year, 2021, uh, the Reserve Bank issued uh, a number of circulars. They're all available uh, if you care to read them, uh, they're available on the uh, Reserve Bank website, which is quite simply resbank.co.za. And the three that um, are important here are circulars 6, 8, and 10, which prescribe the, um, the regulations by which uh, in, in the post-financial um, immigration phase, in other words, uh, that was following the announcement of Titimba when in February 2020, um, the Reserve Bank took um, about a year, a little more than a year, and issued these circulars. Um, and I should also mention, because uh, Circular 10 of 2021 was really updating the exchange control manual, um, and um, uh, it referred to this, those pages that uh, were being changed, and um, nowadays, and in fact, on the 30th of July, I observed uh, the Reserve Bank have posted a completely updated exchange control manual on their website. So um, if you work in these matters or you want to work through the actual finer detail, then um, the Reserve Bank the exchange control manual is um, the document that you should read and it's available uh, online. And... Um, and the final point um, is that, um, as I mentioned, so the, the focal document um, was the MP336B and uh, that uh, the last of the MP336B was attested by the banks on the 28th of February, 2021. Um, and um, in fact, there was a bit of a rush and it didn't matter if you didn't have uh, tax clearance at that stage that would come afterwards. So, um, that uh, pulled the shutters down on the old regime of um, financial uh, immigration. So um, let's look at um, what has, has come in its place. So we replace the concept of financial immigration with a tax immigration, a concept of tax immigration. And what we mean by that is, um, and, and we'll see in, in, in more detail in a moment, that um, the Reserve Bank, in terms of being the, uh, the regulators who administered the process of financial immigration, have taken a complete back step in this, um, and, uh, or back seat rather, and um, handed it over to uh, their sister authority, um, also falling under the Minister of Finance, uh, and that is the South African Revenue Service, 
or SARS. So um, whilst the, the, the concept of immigration and people uh, leaving and being able to um, take their money and so on um, is no longer administered uh, by the Reserve Bank, um, but is under the uh, auspices of SARS, and uh, they have in its place um, a, a number of procedures that uh, are uh, in line, which um, I will take you through uh, during the, the course of this, this presentation. Um, is it a more streamlined approach? Um, I, I think the, the Reserve Bank, and um, uh, I was connected with them, as Daryl mentioned in the introduction, and so um, I may be biased, um, but um, it, it, it's always been a particularly efficient organization, um, the way it's, it's run things. SARS, on the other hand, uh, have been plagued um, over the years uh, during the um, so-called uh, Zuma years of, of um, 2009. Um, it was headed by a, a commissioner who um, did the organization um, uh, no real um, service. Uh, he was removed summarily by President Ramaphosa uh, in the um, early days of, of him taking office in uh, January of 2018. And uh, I must say now under the um, uh, charge of uh, Edward Kieswetter, uh, we're seeing SARS being restored to the organization that I've always known it um, in the days prior to um, uh, Commissioner Tom Moyani being appointed. So um, uh, one shouldn't be uh, particularly intimidated by the fact that uh, SARS are now dealing with um, the, the, uh, the immigration process. And I think at the end of the day, their objective is just to ensure that uh, as long as you've paid your uh, rightful uh, amount of tax uh, that is due, then um, whatever clearances or releases, uh, which now um, is all done electronically and it's, um, it's in the familiar uh, green ticks, um, much like that satisfaction you get when your uh, WhatsApp message has been read. I think those are, are two blue ticks. Well, SARS give you the two green ticks and literally you are um, on your way. So um, let's, uh, Rob, go to the next slide um, and um, look at uh, the financial immigration and um, particularly as I've given you uh, at length what the background uh, and I've explained what the process was like before 1 March 2021, uh, what is much more appropriate now is that we consider since uh, March, 1st of March 2021 um, and the uh, administration by SARS, um, what, uh, what is the process and, and how do you achieve uh, what I've now termed uh, a tax immigration. And uh, there are a couple of points um, that uh, are to be made here. Now, there is the very last bullet point uh, is the TCR01 form. And um, that is the form, the SARS form that effectively replaces the uh, MP336B which was the Reserve Bank's form. Uh, and that Reserve Bank form was in, in place for many, many years. It was first called for an application for a settling allowance. Then it became an immigration that's obviously fallen away and replaced um, by the TCR01 form, which also um, to a large extent replaced the tax clearance uh, that you needed to um, apply to SARS for in conjunction with uh, the uh, Reserve Bank form. So um, that has become the, the main form. But um, it doesn't, unlike the financial immigration and the uh, MP336 was almost uh, compulsorily uh, completed, it was a mandatory form. Uh, the TCR01 um, is, is not um, a must in, in every immigration, depending on the circumstances. 
and um, I'll explain why in a moment. So uh, the most important thing about um, emigrating um, after the 1st of March 2021 is that you need to advise SARS uh, that um, you are going to be non-resident for tax purposes. And um, there are a number of ways you can do that. And in fact, um, SARS have always maintained, uh, and particularly in relation to taxpayers' details, changes of address and so on, that uh, I think it is tucked away within the law uh, and probably nowadays within the Tax Administration Act that uh, if a taxpayer's uh, details or particulars change in any way, then uh, you have 30 days to advise SARS um, of that particular event. So in the same vein, one would, um, if one is going offshore, one would uh, advise SARS. And let's have a look at how do we actually do that? So um, the, the tax case, the TCR01, as I mentioned, is, is, um, is, is not necessary in, in each and every occasion. So the way in which uh, you um, advise SARS is, uh, and is covered in the first three bullet points. So firstly, in the income tax return itself, uh, you, there's a box to check. And, um, and that has actually been changed uh, for um, the 2021 tax return. So the beginning of last month was the start of the tax filing season uh, for the 2021 returns. And um, if uh, there's been a change, uh, if the taxpayers has ceased to be resident, then um, it's in that the, the completion or submission of that tax return that um, SARS will be advised. So um, prior to 2021, and in fact, from 2017, so I, I recall that it appeared in 2017 um, for the very first time in the actual wizard, um, when, and, and those of you that either um, complete your own tax returns or familiar with the process on SARS e filing, the wizard um, is a series of questions which, depending on how you answer those questions, will determine which parts of the um, tax return will open up and require completion. Um, and uh, in the absence uh, or for a negative answer, those uh, sections will be suppressed and hidden and therefore won't be required to be completed. So in the wizard, uh, right at the outset, uh, when you're embarking on completion of the tax return in 2017 for the first time, appeared the question, did you cease to be tax resident um, in the year of assessment uh, with a block for an either a yes or a no? Okay, if you answered yes, um, then uh, that was an alert to SARS that, and um, we'll cover it uh, later on in a, in, in a few slides later, but uh, that you've ceased to be resident and that might trigger uh, an ex exit tax, capital, mainly capital gains tax. And um, what uh, one encountered um, was when you had checked that box um, and um, after you duly then, uh, if you had any, because uh, as I'll uh, repeat uh, in, in a while, ceasing to be resident is one of, the instances of a deemed disposal of certain assets for capital gains tax purposes. So there's an expectation on the part of SARS that if you are indicating that you ceasing to be resident, then um, somewhere in your return and notably in the capital gains tax se section, you will show uh, the proceeds, the base cost and the difference between the two would be your gain or possibly even capital loss. And um, those returns that uh, where that box was checked would in fact not receive the instant assessment within 45 seconds virtually, but uh, would be subject to what SARS called manual intervention. And it would take uh, a week or two or three. And um, once SARS was satisfied during that process, 
that you'd accounted for um, your capital gains on exit. You would then uh, receive your assessment and then just go through the normal uh, audit procedure of um, submitting supporting documents and so on. Now, in the, um, the difficulty with that question and the way it was worded, and it remained the same from 2017 till, until 2020, was that it only asked in relation to ceasing to be a resident in that tax year, in, in the tax year of the return that you're completing. So if you'd ceased to be resident in a prior year or whatever, um, you didn't uh, have to answer it as yes. In fact, you couldn't because factually it just simply wouldn't be correct. And therefore, the question always remained, well, how do you, um, if you'd cease to be resident in a year prior to 2017, how do you advise SARS of this fact, given that the tax return simply didn't uh, afford you that opportunity? In the 2021 return, uh, and those of you who are already uh, ambitious enough to um, start working on, on your tax return, you would see that the wizard has now two questions. And um, the first one is the same question that I referred to a moment ago is, did you cease to be resident in the current tax year? The second question um, asks as to whether you uh, were tax resident or ceased to be tax resident in any other period. And um, it asks for the date in the um, in a specific format, um, and it also asks if you a um, a foreign a foreign person. So I think there are two parts to that question: is are you a, a foreign person, or uh, did you cease at any time to be resident for tax purposes? So there's the opportunity now in the 2021 return and going forward, because I would imagine that SARS will keep that format. Um, in, in future tax returns. So anyone who is emigrating, uh, that will be uh, one of the opportunities of uh, advising SARS. Obviously, when it comes to your address, your residential address and so on, you will provide the, the address in your new country of residence. Now, um, what we've uh, encountered, and, and I, I make reference to the RAVA one, now, the RAVA one is really just part of the SARS e-filing system where uh, you update uh, the taxpayer's details. And um, there is a provision in the RAVA one to show whether that particular taxpayer has ceased to be resident for tax purposes. And again, um, it asks for the date, the full date. So... Um, uh, often I, I ask clients, and particularly those that might have left many years ago, they may not remember the exact day or month. Um, we get as close to it as possible, but it's in the YYYMMDD format, and um, it, it's expected that um, you fill in the date that, that you emigrated. So what the, the RAVA1 does, and you can do that at any time, is it updates uh, your records with SARS uh, in the appropriate manner. So if at any stage um, it, it, it's brought into question as to whether you've advised SARS or whatever, if you've um, completed, um, and it's probably best to do both, um, the, the indicating the change in the 2021. But you may have a situation where, um, someone has already left South Africa, has no taxable income, um, is in fact no longer filing income tax returns because the law only requires you to file a tax return if you have taxable income. So uh, if this is in respect of someone who left uh, many years ago, as I had uh, a case recently, um, it, it was interesting and I'll, I'll share with you how SARS actually came to um, unearth this particular taxpayer's records. Um, and, and it was, he left so long ago that it was in the days prior to the green barcoded identity document that, that we have today. 
And those who, who are perhaps uh, have been around long enough to recall, the predecessor document to that was uh, what we used to call the Book of Life. Uh, it was a blue book. And um, it was the usual ID number with the first six, six digits being your date of birth and so on. Uh, the next four digits indicating your gender, whether you were male or female, and then um, three digits uh, at the end. And um, at the introduction, time of the introduction of the green barcoded ID book, um, everyone's ID number changed from the progression from the, the, the blue book of life, so to speak, to the green ID document. And, and anyone who has come into the system since then will have the new styled ID number. And this particular taxpayer um, received a letter uh, I was his tax practitioner, so the letter came to me. I had to track him down because he left many, many years ago. And um, the letter simply said, um, we've checked and we've done an update with the population register of the Department of Home Affairs. And we just want to let you know that SARS has updated their records with your new ID number. And I thought, wow, um, uh, SARS, even remembering this guy, he left so long ago, um, I contacted him. And there was a discussion as to whether we should now at this point in time, um, because SARS have um, acknowledged that he still exists, uh, should we do the, the RAVA one and um, put in the actual date that he, he left and, and update it with his current residential address and, and so on. So um, there's, this is the, the interface, and, and this is how you would, in fact, um, under the new dispensation, advise SARS of ceasing to be tax resident. And um, I'll just deal uh, briefly with the, uh, the tax clearance, the TCR01. Now, um, it's an interesting form. Um, it's a new form, uh, and it's now in use since the... Uh, the 1st of March, 2021. Um, and, um, and it's available online um, in, the, um, in, the, in the same section where you, you deal with your compliance status. Um, and there's a drop-down menu, and one of them is, it's called simply immigration. And if you click on that box, it will unload for you um, the, the TCR01. And... Um, it's very similar uh, if, if one compares it to uh, in, in resemblance to the previous uh, Reserve Bank MP336 form and um, with some uh, very interesting uh, observations that um, I can share with you. And that is there is a, a, a block where you need to, um, if you're ceasing to be resident, you need to show what your um, standard of assets and liabilities are like on a snapshot basis. And um, interestingly, that only requires the recording of South African assets. Um, and, and in that respect, it was identical to the uh, predecessor, the MP336B, because um, it was simply not required in that document, nor in the current uh, SARS TCR01, for you to record any foreign assets, um, those would appear to be um, off the radar. Uh, and certainly for purposes of this clearance, uh, it is only um, South African assets that uh, are required. So the TCR01, um, and you would need that. Um, so just to give you an indication of when would you be able to just um, manage with um, advising SARS in the tax return or in the a uh, RAVA one form, and when would you need to do the TCR one? If you're looking to take money with you, um, then uh, there's uh, a block, and it asks for um, the amount of money that you're taking, how you're going to be investing it, are you going to remain uh, a taxpayer in South Africa? And and that's a good point to mention that emigrating um, doesn't doesn't necessarily mean that you are resigning from this elite club of being a SARS taxpayer because uh, all it means is that you cease being um, taxable on your worldwide income 
uh, but uh, you remain taxable on any uh, South African sourced income. So if you s- still have a property in South Africa after having emigrated uh, and that property um, from which you derive rental income, then of course, um, SARS will look to you uh, for tax on that rental income for as long as you own the property, but only seek to tax you on a source basis, no longer on a worldwide basis. So, um, so that's an important aspect um, when you confront the, uh, the TCR01 form is that you're only required to uh, reflect um, assets in South Africa. So those that you might have moved offshore um, as a result of the, um, the tax, uh, the investment allowances that I mentioned earlier that came about in October 2010, or even if you um, moved them offshore, perhaps uh, in contravention of exchange control, but you used the opportunity uh, that was made available to the government, uh, by the government, uh, most recently in the uh, Voluntary Disclosure Program or the SVDP, the Special Voluntary Disclosure Program, then um, even though you've regularized those assets, they aren't uh, required to to be reflected. So um, let us move now to talk about citizenship. And again, um, I I think as Daryl mentioned, um, uh, and I I think there, there are three questions in the, the Q&A, so feel free on, on any matters that um, arise from this presentation. Uh, uh, Robert, who's part of the team who's sitting in the control room, uh, will um, collate and perhaps filter some of the duplicates, but you're more than welcome to present any questions which uh, we will deal with uh, at the end of the, of the presentation. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned uh, the impact on citizenship. Um, a lot of people are um, perhaps um, under the uh, impression that uh, emigrating is a forfeiture or um, a removal of your rights to citizenship. And that is clearly definitely not the case. And I just want to draw your attention to to a couple of interesting points that um, hang under this topic of of citizenship. Um, And that is um, firstly um, that of dual nationality. So um, in terms of the Citizenship Act, uh, a South African, a South African citizen uh, is entitled to um, acquire the uh, citizenship of another country, perhaps by ancestry or by conferral or on, on whatever basis. And um, as long as you meet uh, the Department of Home Affairs requirements, which uh, are, the, are the next point, then you can, in fact, go on and acquire the citizenship in the new country of uh, residence. And um, I should just pause on this point because um, an interesting requirement of the MP336, uh, which hasn't been carried through in the SARS process, um, and that is the Reserve Bank always required you to prove, if you were emigrating, that you have a right of residence in the country to which you're emigrating. So um, either uh, a visa or um, a passport through ancestry or some basis where you're entitled to go and take up residence in some countries um, in terms of the the, uh, don't require visas and and, uh, operate under a principle of a law of return. Now, that requirement has not carried forward under the tax immigration. And whilst it's true to say that the uh, TCR01 just asks uh, which country you're emigrating to. Uh, you merely state the country, but without the requirement to actually provide proof, um, either by means of a passport or a visa or, or whatever. So I found that quite interesting that um, that requirement um, uh, appears to have uh, been relaxed or fallen uh, by the wayside. 
So what does the Department of Home Affairs require of you uh, if you are seeking the citizenship of another country? Uh, there are basically two forms, and um, um, the, the, firm, the first form relates to an application for a determination um, of your citizenship. And um, that is really if you'd left or if you'd left the country uh, when you're applying, they just want to proof and it's in relation to whether you were born and where your parents were born. Those are the sort of questions that are asked in that form. Uh, we can provide anyone with copies of those forms should you wish. And then the second part of the applications, they're done almost contemporaneously, uh, more or less at the same time is a, um, a retention of citizenship. So, so um, Home Affairs will give you actual uh, permission to retain your South African citizenship, notwithstanding the fact that you um, are acquiring the citizenship of uh, another country. And the important thing is that you actually have to approach Home Affairs prior to uh, obtaining the citizenship uh, of the new country. So can, those countries where you might be approved as a citizen, but then there is a, um, a ceremony where you get handed uh, your certificate and perhaps are required to sing the national anthem of, of the new country uh, and so on. And um, it's only you can, you're required to, to complete these formalities any time up to the actual ceremony. Um, even though you've been approved as a citizen, um, Home Affairs would allow you at any time prior to that. And, and the recommendation, and if you call any of the South African embassies, uh, they will tell you telephonically that if your ceremony is coming up that you, and you haven't had the required documents from Home Affairs, that you should try and delay the ceremony because then you may have deemed not to have complied with those requirements um, and therefore not afforded dual nation nationality in terms of the Citizenship Act. So, and, and that is problematic, hugely problematic, because um, since the advent of COVID, uh, Home Affairs um, shut down um, the, the department and, and they were working uh, on alternate weeks, uh, the department that issues, because the approval uh, under the, the citizenship is just a simple letter which says that um, you um, you have the consent to acquire the um, nationality, say, of, of the UK or, or any other country. Uh, and it's a very simple letter, and yet it's, it's much needed. Um, and if you don't get it and you accept the citizenship of another country, um, there may be issues. And um, that really leads us to the next point, uh, which is a very recent judgment. Uh, I think it went to court um, in uh, May of 2021. It was an application brought uh, before the court by the Democratic Alliance. And um, what the DA was mindful of was that many South Africans um, had left South Africa and for a variety of reasons, didn't complete the formalities uh, or the requirements uh, in getting that permission. And, and they felt that it was uh, constitutional um, against the constitution to um, deny those people their citizenship simply because um, they didn't receive that um, required letter. So uh, the case was heard by um, uh, Judge Colopin, and, um, and unfortunately, and, and the judgment um, is available uh, if you care to read it, uh, he found against the DA and um, upheld that the uh, requirements of home affairs in terms of citizenship uh, were still in order. And I understand that um, that leave for appeal in terms of that judgment uh, of the High Court um, has been applied for. And that's going to be an interesting one. And I think it will probably land up uh, next uh, at the Constitutional Court. Uh, it might be even more interesting because 
Judge Colopin is one of the few judges who um, is being interviewed by the uh, the JSC, the J Judicial Services Commission, for a vacancy in the Constitutional Court. And so if he does move uh, up to Bromfontein Hill, assuming he is appointed, then um, he may have to recuse himself or not be part of um, the 11 judges that come to decide on uh, on this matter. But very interesting, uh, if you're in the immigration space and, and you're worried about citizenship, uh, these are our current developments, which um, one needs to, to be aware of. Let's look um, at the exit tax. Um, Robert, thank you. Oh, um, uh, so, this was section 9H. Um, There's another amendment uh, that we're going to talk about as well, um, also to section 9H. So, um, and it, it's um, based on the principle that uh, when you cease to be a resident, as I mentioned earlier, and a number of things uh, happen. And one of them is that there's a deemed disposal of your assets for capital gains tax um, purposes. Now, um, other than emigrating, there's another event where uh, you are, there's a deemed disposal for CGT purposes. Um, and that is uh, when you die. So um, uh, with proper planning, um, you may uh, want to choose uh, the event that um, uh, at which you, you trigger the, the liability for capital gains tax. And, and hopefully it's uh, in the circumstances that we're discussing now. Now, uh, let's look at or consider which assets are subject to capital gains tax on the, uh, the ceasing to be resident. Uh, generally, it's all your financial assets. Uh, so any uh, shares, um, unit trusts, um, collective investment schemes, those types of assets will all have to be valued if you haven't sold them as part and parcel of the winding up of your affairs. Uh, if you remain with those assets, then you would need to uh, get values for them. And um, on the basis of deducting the base cost, when you acquire those assets, uh, any capital gain would be required to be brought to account when you cease to be resident. Now, um, the, the assets which uh, are not subject to CGT are um, basically any fixed property or real estate that you own directly in your own name. In that instance, there's a deferral and you will only pay the CGT even after you've left South Africa um, by uh, at the time that you actually sell the assets. So it's not a deemed disposal. Uh, the liability is um, deferred until you actually sell. And if you've already left South Africa and you sell a property as now a non-resident for tax purposes, then there is a section 35 cap A and the conveyances who will handle the, the sale of that property on your behalf, uh, there will be a um, mandatory withholding tax so that um, off the proceeds, SARS doesn't want to quite looking for you, come looking for you in your new country of residence. Um, at the point of transfer, um, the capital gains tax or a, a fixed percentage will be withheld paid over to SARS and, and you can then, if it was a primary residence, uh, you can then mitigate and um, reduce the capital gain and, and get a refund later. Now, um, fixed properties that are held through companies are um, subject to disposal. So that's an exception to the rule that I've just mentioned. If you hold the property, not directly, but indirectly, via a company or even a close corporation, and there are many of those that are still around, um, 
even though they've been they came in in, in 1984 35 years ago the um in those circumstances then there is a deemed disposal and um there could be a pitfall because when that entity be it a property owning company or close corporation then actually sells the property uh that would trigger capital gains tax within the entity as well so one just has to manage that uh, very very carefully when is um cgt payable um if there is a liability for capital gains tax uh it is only um at the end of the tax year there's no attempt and it used to be in the old days of um uh, an immigrant's office uh where you needed to go and visit them before you left and they would issue a manual assessment and you'd have to pay and literally um settle up before you left that's not the case and the capital gains tax is payable through the normal system um after the uh, end of the tax year so if you're a provisional taxpayer just and, and depending on the, the amount of the capital gains tax payable just watch that for provisional tax purposes because if you're over a million rand you will need to come in pretty accurately uh, ac- be pretty accurate with um your uh, payment of provisional tax but otherwise on assessment right um let us now um in in the the last couple of minutes uh, deal with the issues relating to uh, retirement annuities uh, um thanks rob if we can just get that slide up thank you so the um situation really in relation to retirement annuities um needs to be discussed uh because under the uh, old regime you know that's the fin- financial immigration uh and if you were 55 years or younger at the time that you left then um if you wanted to um cash in your retirement annuity um you could do so and as long as the you were considered part of the old regime if your mp336b was um attested prior to the 28th of february 2021 uh, and that's based on a provision in the income tax act which has now been amended which said that um in terms of uh withdrawal from retirement annuities uh it is only permitted in two circumstances if the person is under the age of 55 and secondly if they had emigrated and of course uh given what we've discussed earlier the the concept of emigration and the mp336 was falling away so in its place sars uh, enacted an amendment and that is what we've just colloquially called a three year lockup and that um requirement is that so if you are part of the new regime immigration in other words what uh we've come to call a tax immigration then uh you can only cash in your your retirement annuity once you have been a non-tax resident for a continuous period of 3 years so that's fine in the relation to um someone that i mentioned that left many years ago and that has gone back and fixed up using the uh the rava one form and, and so on because then it's clear on um on record with sars um you do need to go through the tcr01 process and um as as part of that some of the documents that they might require is um proof that you are not tax resident and perhaps if you're paying tax in your new country of residence a copy of that assessment or some of the the tax offices around the world are very good at giving you a letter or certificate of residency and um if that is uploaded uh, as part and parcel of applying for the TCR01 if you've been out for the more than 3 years uh, you fine um if not then you've got to sit out the process so if you've left recently and um and you didn't get to uh, do your MP336 uh, and are now working under the the new regime of 
what we've been discussing throughout uh, today's presentation, then just bear in mind that you'll be subject to a three-year lockup period. And then, um, then there's a proposed amendment. You've probably, in the last uh, week, um, I've noticed considerable uh, attention to this in the uh, lay media, and um, that is the new proposed amendment, uh, which is still in draft form, in the Taxation Laws Amendment Bill, which uh, uh, is out for comment. So it hasn't even gone to Parliament yet. Uh, it's out there for comment. And um, I can assure you, plenty comment uh, will be drawn by this particular document. And um, one of them, in, in fact, that I'm aware of, and, and they're a great industry um, represents, representative of their products and, and all their, their customers and policyholders and so on, is uh, an organization known as ASISA, which stands for the Association for Savings and Investment South Africa. And... Um, I'm aware that uh, a 10-page uh, submission, and ASISA was actually uh, years ago known um, by a different name when it was mainly the insurance companies. It was called the uh, LOA or Life Officers Association. The Life Officers are now part of ASISA together with the other um, financial institutions and, and those that are part of the saving system. And um, I, I have no doubt uh, that... Um, when this uh, submission uh, in response to the comments that are called for um, arrives on the steps of the National Treasury at Church Square in Pretoria, uh, this legislation will be probably withdrawn um, because I think uh, it needs a complete write up, uh, a rewrite. And some of the things that they're proposing and, and the, the history to this is that the government are very aware of that they lose revenue because of um, the operation of, of double tax agreements and so on. And therefore, they are saying that if you cease to be resident for tax purposes and um, you have um, any retirement product, you are deemed to have uh, withdrawn on the day before you cease to be a tax resident. And um, it's a complicated system that's proposed where um, you need to go and get a value at that particular date. A tax liability is uh, determined. It's not payable. Uh, there's an interest factor of 7% that then gets uh, built in. I mean, I come across one problem immediately where during the period, someone would move from a withdrawal situation because of their age to being eligible for the retirement tables. So there's clearly, uh, to the extent that the uh, retirement tables are slightly more uh, preferential than the withdrawal tables, uh, there's prejudice. So um, as was mentioned to me by one of the, the members of uh, ASISA that um, – this sort of legislation could prevent them selling retirement annuity policies completely. I mean, if, if you're aware of this and, and these restrictive practices, uh, why would you enter into a retirement annuity? And so the industry is um, extremely concerned, and I would, um, uh, I would watch with great keenness uh, the space once they make their submission. And as we've seen in the past with... Um, other uh, proposals in the budget uh, that are drafted, um, they've either been withdrawn or significantly amended. And I think this is certainly one to, to watch. Right, we're going to conclude now with the um, this situation of the expat tax. It's largely been dealt with, but I'll just run through it um, uh, because I think we're, we're all familiar with it. It's, um, it's anomalous because we, we've been speaking about ceasing to be tax resident and this exemption that we speak of, um, 1010, uh, makes the assumption that, uh, as you'll see in the um, fourth, fifth uh, bullet point, that it applies only to residents and that's tax resident. 
And it, it was this whole uh, expat tax um, hype and frenzy and fuss, as I referred to it earlier, that resulted in the Reserve Bank, I believe, um, on the basis of good reform of exchange control, actually abolishing the concept of immigration. And the reason was this, there were some, what um, I believe to be um, uh, unscrupulous uh, immigration boutiques that were around who were um, creating uh, rumor mongering amongst people who'd long since left South Africa saying that they could, unless they had actually financially immigrated, SARS could come after them and hound them for tax that they were earning in their present country of residence. I mean, that was an absolute absurdity, but it did frighten many, many people to, into unnecessarily uh, applying for financial immigration. And I think we recall um, in talking to the non-resident centers of the major authorized dealers, uh, they had huge volumes and therefore that would have filtered through to the reserve bank. And, um, and I think that um, the, the expat tax rules now um, insofar as people are still residents for, for tax purposes, um, there is the exemption, which is now one and a quarter million. But um, once you cease being a resident, then um, th this issue falls away entirely. And um I think that um, it, it's, we're just aware of it simply because this was the cause of all the changes in, in the first place. Right. Uh, I think that we've uh, almost uh, kept to the time within um, the hour. So we've um, got ample questions or time for questions. Thanks, Anthony, again, for your time. Uh, very insightful and, and obviously kind of shows in the number of questions a fair amount of overlap and duplication as you would expect. So I'll moderate that as we go. Also, there's some pretty individualized questions as has been the case in previous webinars. And, and again, after the presentation between ourselves and the team at Ceridium, we'll try and deal with as many as we can. So, you know, starting off here, Anthony, you know, a lot of talk about, you know, if I complete my tax immigration in this, in this tax year, so in 2021, I apply and go through the relevant process. Does that mean that I no longer have to file a return in 2022? At what point do I stop filing a return to SARS? Okay, excellent question. Um, and uh, I touched on it, but it's worthy of a repetition. Okay, so um, if you, in your tax return, advise SARS that you're ceasing to be resident. In other words, when the wizard wax uh, um, opens up um, and, uh, and you indicate the date that you've ceased to be resident, um, that doesn't in itself absolve you from any obligation to uh, submit tax returns in the future. You may be uh, leaving um, assets behind in South Africa. There may be properties in which you're deriving rental income. So um, the, the fact that you are um, ceasing to be resident uh, doesn't remove you off the register of taxpayers because, as I say, you, you may need to be um, – there might be an, an RA, for example, um, or, or whatever. And so um, when, when can you safely come off the register is uh, if you uh, are no longer going to be in receipt of, of any taxable income. I would generally allow the dust to settle. Um, you can always just submit null returns. Um, or if you believe that you are um, no longer liable to submit a return, then in your SARSI filing profile, you simply don't request a return for the next year. So when 2022 comes along um, and you've really got nothing to tell SARS, SARS's records are up to date with your new um, uh, country of residence and residential address and so on, then you simply don't request the return. And um, I, I think that you, you'll, you'll be okay. We, we've just got to watch because SARS do sometimes charge administrative pen penalties for non-submission. But I think that if you've painstakingly advised them, as I, I believe the person who posed that question is intending to do, then uh, you should be okay. 
If I choose to financially immigrate and yet still have South African income producing assets, is it the right thing to do to financially immigrate? Where do I pay tax? Can I still earn income in South Africa? So um, I, I think that one, uh, and I've always said this in, in my many years as a practitioner, one shouldn't let the tax tail wag the dog. Um, and uh, what may well happen is um, once you've left and you have um, income producing assets in South Africa is, um, and, and your residence shifts to a, um, a, another country. And we did one of these seminars in March and, and we had a lot of questions just around this very issue is where am I tax resident and who do I have to account for? And um, recently I've come across people who believe, like I spoke about dual nationality, there is a belief that there's dual tax residence. And I don't believe that that exists. You're either tax resident in one country or the other. And particularly if that country has a treaty with South Africa, then that treaty overrides the domestic provisions and you will be possibly tax resident in the other country. So um, I think that your answer there, Daryl, is that um, you just need to follow the rules of um, the country uh, that you're becoming a resident of. And if it's a country in, in the first world that taxes you on a worldwide income, uh, on worldwide income, then um, it, it depends. You either got to look at whether you pay tax on a source basis or on a residence basis and whether you have to uh, claim a credit for the tax paid in the other country, because the treaty will always come to your aid and give you the relief from double taxation. Um, but it is a bit of an admin um, bind. And sometimes the tax years, the USA tax year runs January to December. South Africa runs March to February. So um, you get uh, incomes that straddle different tax years and it's complicated to work out your credits and so on. But um, the, I think the simple answer to your question is one would just need to look at the facts and the laws uh, of the country that you're moving to and the double tax treaty between that country and South Africa. Thank you. Um, what about financial immigration followed by a South African inheritance that gets earned? Are you able to get that overseas? Uh, absolutely. So, um, and a very good, another very good question. And I thank the person um, posing these questions because it shows uh, a, a lot of the insight into what we've been discussing. So, prior to um, 1 March 2021, if you emigrated um, you, through the MP336 me method and your immigration was on record with the Reserve Bank, then uh, an inheritance after that fact uh, is, in fact, very simple. And um, if you've emigrated, you just simply provide and the executor of the estate from which you're inheriting um, is pro uh, will just provide a copy of the will the liquidation and distribution account, perhaps a death certificate. And um, that amount, if you still had one of the old style blocked accounts, um, it can be paid in there and remitted immediately um, to you offshore. Um, uh, under the new uh, dispensation of the tax immigration, um, and Robert of our office has been handling a number of these recently where um, – on that basis, uh, it's, you go through the TCR01. And, um, and, and I think that if, you, if you've left um, and you're no longer a taxpayer, there is a mechanism where SARS will still allow those funds to go and won't necessarily require you to reactivate your tax number. Um, so that, that can be done. So it's not a, uh, an impediment um, to tax immigration in terms of being able to receive an inheritance. Okay, so probably the most duplicated question today, Anthony, is, is one around what assets are covered insofar as the exit levy goes? Now, is it just South African assets? Does it relate to worldwide assets? Um, does it include local endowments or offshore endowments? You know, what are we paying tax on here once we financially immigrate? 
excellent question. And, um, you know, I would think the correct answer to that is that if you've got worldwide assets, and notwithstanding my comments earlier when dealing with the, the TCR01, um, you are ceasing to be tax residents. So it's all your assets, South African and um, outside of South Africa, that uh, would need to be, that fall into that category. So in other words, as long as they're not, um, uh, they don't comprise property that is owned directly. Um, but in, in all other instances, investments, shares, and so on, uh, you would pay tax um, on your um, local and foreign assets. And then with capital gains tax in those countries um, that have a capital gains tax regime, which most have, the value, that value um, on the date you cease to be resident, on the next day, being the day you arrive, becomes your new base cost. So um, on foreign assets, yes, you're paying capital gains tax, but uh, you're then achieving a step up because you've paid the capital gains tax um, on the day you land going forward until the actual disposal. Great, and, thank and you. Sorry, so, Darren, so, I, I yeah. should just add that that gets complicated with properties because, as I said, um, real estate or properties that you own directly, there's no, um, there's no disposal at the time you cease to be, em uh, you cease, uh, you cease to be resident and uh, tax, em um, tax immigration, undergo tax immigration. When you arrive in your new country, the, that property will be valued and um, so when you ultimately dispose of it, uh, there would be two instances of capital gains tax because on a CITES basis, South Africa would claim capital gains tax on the basis that you've then disposed of. And then in your new country on a residence basis, they uh, could also claim perhaps the difference between the gain um, on the date you sold, the proceeds in other words, and the value, the base cost when you landed in that country. So, um, but again, the treaties will come uh, into play uh, and you'll never be taxed twice. Quite a lot of interest in retirement products, Anthony, so perhaps worth a bit of repetition here as well. So quite some of the questions, I'll fire off a few in a row. Um, retirement annuities, preservation and pension obviously are being regulated under a, a Reg 28 of the Pension Fund Act. If I immigrate, can I own more offshore assets in my South African retirement annuity is one. And how, how are living annuities treated? Are they treated differently from an immigration point of view to retirement annuities? Or is it okay. still the same three-year rule that applies going forward? Yep. So living annuities, if you are already, yeah, sorry, and I'm dealing with your last question first, if I may, Daryl. Um, living annuities, uh, if you are already reached retirement age and you've pressed the button uh, and you are now in annuity mode, um, then I think um, th there's, there's not much you can do. And in fact, uh, a number of people who uh, I observed, uh, what they actually did is, is if they had a living annuity, uh, they were of retirement age they would then um, do two things, um, take the maximum one third that is permissible. And then in terms of the annuity, uh, crank it up um, to uh, the maximum, which I think is 17 and a half percent and, um, and, and get your, your capital out or your annuity, but it's, it, it goes out. Uh, it's, it's fully remittal, uh, remittal in the old days, with a purchased annuity, you had to work out the capital um, element and the income element and the capital element was blocked. But nowadays it's, it's a much more simple. And, um, but the other question uh, that was part of your question is that um, if, you, um, if you're taking out a retirement annuity prior to um, um, tax immigration, and um, I was uh, on a call with a client and um, his uh, in financial advisor the other day. Um, within the portfolio, the underlying assets of uh, retirement annuities and living annuities, you can choose virtually an entirely offshore portfolio. I believe that's permitted. Again, I'm not an expert in that field and 
probably, Daryl, you within your office do have people that uh, work on this on a day-to-day basis. But um, you you can certainly um, load uh, the underlying portfolio with with almost entirely uh, offshore assets. Um, so that is indeed the case for living annuities. Anthony, you're right. Um, yes. From my understanding, the question more related to being a tax resident abroad with retirement annuities, would that bring it out of the Regulation 28 net? In other words, can you hold more than the 30% plus 5% in Africa? I don't believe that you can, but perhaps we can look into that. Yes, I, that would need someone um, who uh, is familiar with, with Reg 28 uh, and... Um, um, yeah, they'd be more qualified yeah. to, to answer that. Perfect. Yeah. How, how reversible is all of this, Anthony? I mean, obviously, if uh, you just talk about... Another let's, good let's, question. Let's, let's talk yeah. about some of the pros and cons, really, in a high level yeah. of financially immigrating. And if I choose to do it, can I reverse it one day? I think particularly yes. about South Africans temporarily abroad, um, as an example, playing sport perhaps in Japan for a couple of years who may return to South Africa. What is my consideration? Do I immigrate from a tax perspective? And what happens if I come back to SA one day? Okay. So, um, I mean, you mentioned leaving for, for sport or, or whatever. I mean, there are a number of facets to, to this particular question. Um, if you are just uh, uh, leaving and um, from a tax point of view, you regard yourself as being ordinarily resident in South Africa, so on the very first test, which is a subjective test, um, and you, you're going for a tour of duty, whether it be to play sport because a club um, somewhere has signed you up if you're a football or rugby player or whatever, then um, but you, um, you remain a tax resident. Uh, you don't have to go through the tax um, immigration process. Uh, you can, in fact... Um, the income that you earn offshore whilst you're playing for that club offshore um, uh, and possibly even your transfer fee if you were paid a biggie uh, can all be retained offshore. Uh, so it's permissible within our exchange control regulations for you to keep those funds offshore. Um, now, the tax is is a good question and, and that deals with the expat tax um, that um, I mentioned. So if you remain a resident of South Africa, which I believe – uh, on those facts, and every every situation is different, but on those facts, uh, you would remain resident. Then uh, 10.1.0, the exemption in 10.1.0 kicks in, and the first one and a quarter million rand um, of your remuneration or income is exempt, and you would pay tax above that. Fantastic. Yeah, and 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 and. In the instance of reversal, is it quite a is it quite a ah, difficult uh, process? Yes, Can it be thank reversed? you, Daryl. Um, reversal now under the old regime, and that's uh, it's not that old. I mean, it was uh, it existed right up until twenty eighth of February, twenty twenty one. If you came back within five years, you were regarded, and I hated this term every time it was mentioned. You were regarded as a failed immigrant. And um, even prior to that, in the days of uh, blocked accounts and you were, where you were allowed setting in allowances, then as a failed immigrant within the five years, um, you had to bring back what you were allowed to take out. Okay. Now, that has um, changed somewhat um, uh, under the, the, the new regime. I, I, the the failed immigration um, issue, because that involved, um, for exchange control purposes, immigrating and then immigrating, okay? Um, under the, the current dispensation, you would um, cease being a resident and go through the process um, that I mentioned. And then if um, within a period, either things didn't work out or you came to the end of your tour of duty or whatever, uh, you came back, you would certainly then just become uh, almost an immigrant again and, and you would um, start submitting returns from um, the date that you became resident. And in fact, uh, I've seen in some jurisdictions in relation to those questions that I refer to, 
did you cease to be a resident? Uh, they also, um, Australia is one country that I know for a fact has a question, did you commence being a resident and you can put in the date? So uh, you can, to some extent, flip in and out of tax residency. Just got to watch um, the, the issues of um, triggering the deemed disposal of your assets. But uh, it, it can be done. All right. Thank you again, Anthony. I think that that covers just about most of the, the, the topical issues that have come through in the questions. If we haven't covered your questions today, please feel free to contact you know, most likely the team that you see on the screen in front of you or your team at Anchor. Thank you again for your attendance across the four webinars that we've hosted. We look forward to hosting you again in the future. If you haven't got any of the four recordings, obviously with today's to follow shortly, please get in contact with us. Uh, stay safe and see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.